Good morning. Hello. Great to, great to see you this morning. How, how are you? Are you, are you well? Uh, are, you, are you feeling lighter uh, through, through being here this morning? Uh, if I've not met you, uh, my name is um, oh, Andrew Blythe. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. And uh, oh, Leadership Network, uh, Andrew Blythe. And uh, I collect. Uh, anyone else collect lanyards and badges? Yeah. Um, I wonder what the ones around your neck are. Uh, this morning. Why don't you just turn to your neighbour and just, what are the, the labels that you have? Uh, some of you might have work titles. Unfortunately, in the weird west, we usually go straight away to work titles, so you might want to turn to your neighbour and tell them that. But what are the other uh, lanyards that you have on this morning or name badges? Quickly to turn to your neighbour, just give them a few of them. So, here we go. I, uh, I won't do a competition for the, the, the most, um, but, but let me just share, if, as I say, so um, uh, lead pastor of Trinity Cheltenham. Uh, oh, team rector of, of Trinity Cheltenham. That's a good one, isn't it? Area dean of Cheltenham. Mm, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, um, educated. Here's another one. I've got a degree. Uh, I've got more than one degree, actually. But uh, yeah, so, so educated. That's, a, that's another one of the labels that, that I wear. Um, oh, industrialised. Yes, I, I live in the bit of the world that is industrialised. Um, uh, maybe you do as well. Oh, um, Western. Here's, here's another one. I live in the, the West. Um, oh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm democratic. So, so I, I basically believe that my choice, my independent choice, is the most important, important thing. And my, my, ethics, my ethics are that as long as I'm not hurting anyone else and that it makes me happy, then, then it's good. That's one of the labels that, that I've got. Oh, here's another one. I'm, I'm rich. I am in... Well, no, don't laugh because, I mean, some of you are much richer than me, but I am obscenely rich in the world obscenely rich in the world did uh, sorry i mean do laugh if you didn't have to think about turning a tap on this morning getting clean water no um food yeah everyone got food for today yeah um uh, I, I have two cars clearly need two cars to drive at the same time uh, anyone else in the room obscenely rich yeah, yeah. Embarrassingly rich. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's another one I've got. Um, oh, and then I'm the person who's meant to deliver a really great talk today so that we have lots of money as a church. <laughs> that's, that's this one. That weighs quite, quite heavily. Um, yeah, I wonder, you know, you've got your work ones as well, some of you. You've got your family ones as well, some of you. And... and um, I don't know. These, these feel quite heavy. I only, I only collected just a few out of my lanyard drawer. I mean, that's how sad being a leader of a church is. <laughs> Some of you have got sock drawers. I have a lanyard drawer. We're, um, we have a conviction as a, as a church family. I hope it's our conviction, not just those of us who get called to leave. We've got a bit of a conviction that, that God really wants to do some amazing things. It's about doing some amazing things. It's not actually just a conviction here at Trinity. It's a conviction that is being shared by, by many. Um, and the thing is that God seems to be saying to us about being prepared for what he's wanting to do. That, that God really does want to move. I, I, I have to be so careful, don't we? You know, we live in extraordinary times. By the way, that's another weird, Western-educated, industrialised, rich, democratic 
mindset that our times must be the most exceptional times. No one else has lived in times like us. I have to be really quite careful about that. But there is a bit of a sense that God is on the move, wants to be on the move in in our church and in lots of churches. I shared earlier uh, this year about the sense of maybe we're moving into a spiritual season of, of spring. And uh, the weather today and yesterday has perfectly illustrated that you think you've left winter and you hope it's spring, but it isn't. And then, you know, Mark's got his shorts on, which is great. It's always spring and summer. (laughs) But, you know, I had to... Anyone get caught out by having to do the car this morning? Yeah. How many cars do you own? Sorry, if you're obscenely rich. Um. And the Lord has been saying something to us about getting prepared. About being prepared for the sense in which he wants to invite us into some really wonderful things. And God has said, to to be prepared, it starts with your heart. It it starts with the desire for intimacy with, with me as God. You know, I, I don't want you to. Um, I don't want you to uh, to really do anything. Actually, first and foremost, I I want you. And so that's why we're in this series about what it means to be called by God into intimate relationship. Some of us might not quite like that word intimate or might struggle with the sense of being intimate with the sovereign God, having talked about fear of the Lord. But it means close familiarity, doesn't it? Close familiarity with God. Are you close and familiar with God. Um, you know, and, and you, could, you can have lanyards that say lead pastor Trinity Cheltenham, uh, been a Christian for 30, no, 47 years. Uh, you can have all kinds of lanyards. But actually the lanyard isn't the thing, isn't it? Because the lanyard, the badge is on the outside. And where does the Lord look? Just in case you've forgotten, turn to your neighbour and remind them. Where does the Lord look? The heart. So we're asking in Lent some heart questions. That book, Anonymous, has a brilliant, simple thesis that Jesus had an iceberg life, 90% hidden for 10% public. It's actually a real call to someone, anyone who dares to even remotely stand two steps up above contradiction. But actually, it's for us all. Do you have an iceberg life? What's, what's the state of your heart? What's the inner you? Are you close and familiar with God? It's a really simple question. It has the most profound, profound impact though, doesn't it? Because I know there are some people who, who, like I can be, feel weighed down by the lanyards, by the badges, by the labels... And I know that God, that none of that is from God. Because in God there is freedom. And I'm going to talk about money this morning. And the reason I'm going to talk about it in a little bit is because that's one of the hugest, biggest areas in which we all can find freedom. And I'll share a little bit about my journey on that. But we've been exploring, we are exploring some biblical metaphors. So one of the labels that we can take on, one of the badges we can have on our heart is, as Hills was reminding us, that we're children, first and foremost, we're children of God. We're daughters, we're sons of God. And as Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he said, you know, you've been adopted into God's family. You've, you've been given that certificate that, that, that your name has changed, your status has changed and when you're adopted as you were in Roman Greco-Roman world and, and even today of course when you're adopted into the family then it's all yours you share in it all and every single one of us says Paul has been adopted into God's family 
We're sons, we're daughters. And that's a picture, a metaphor that goes, goes through the Bible. That's, that's the number one label on our hearts that God wants to, or scripture talks about it being on our, on our hands. And then the other ones we're following on from. Here is your one and only opportunity today to do a sheep impression. Last week we were talking about what does it mean to be sheep with God as our shepherd? Q? Thank you very much. What does it mean to know that you, that you need the shepherd and actually the freedom of having a shepherd? There's that word again, freedom. Today, we're thinking about being stewards, stewards. And I don't know whether that's a word that's familiar to you. I was on a plane recently to Kenya, some of you know, and there was a a, a woman with a a young girl who was really not going to sit in the seat to put her seatbelt signs on, you know, seatbelt signs. She was not going to do this. She was going to sit on mummy's lap. And one by one, the air crew came. First came the confident young man. Hello, darling, you want to sit in your seat, don't you? No! (laughs) Okay, then another sort of younger woman came along. Hello, darling, if you sit in your seat, I'll give you a sweet. No! (laughs) Then a sort of slightly older woman comes along. Hello, darling, is this your favourite toy? Maybe you could sit in your seat with Teddy. No! Finally... The mature older lady came and sat down and said, you are sitting in your seat. (laughs) I don't know whether you're familiar, that kind of concept of stewarding someone who, because the reason was that the child would be at danger, in danger. And actually the rest of us would have been in danger if the steward had not done their job. There was a precious cargo that needed to be protected. Or maybe maybe you've seen stewards as in the ones who will be at the race course. Part of my history is being a steward at Wimbledon Tennis and getting paid in in towels, player towels, and going to the BBC canteen and giving my mate a towel in return for steak and chips. That's another story I have repented. When I was trained to be a steward, I was shown a video, I've said this before, and it said a good, a good steward, a good security guard is like a potted plant. There but never really noticed. You can imagine how 200 students spent the next two weeks going, potted plant. <laughs> Responsibility for looking after and caring for what has been entrusted to them. Genesis 2.15 is the starting point to think about what the Bible says. The Lord God took man, using that for all humanity, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Fundamentally, stewardship, being a steward, is all about grace. It's all about God's free giving to us, undeserved. It's all about how God takes you as a daughter, as a son, adopted into his family so seriously and says, I want to give you part of all of this to share in its care. To use it in the right possible way. To use it in the way that you know the owner wants it to be used. I wonder if there are any here who've had that responsibility of of guardianship or that responsibility of of, uh, being responsible for another person's financial affairs. Some of us with older parents have that kind of responsibility. And, and what are you called to do? You're called to say to yourself, what decision would this person have made? What would they have wanted with their money, with their possessions? Can I bear that responsibility of being a good steward? 
The Bible has over 2,000 verses about money and thinking about stewarding in relating to possessions. And don't worry, it is gift day. I am going to get there. But fundamentally, stewardship, being called a steward, having this label on us is about the grace that God gives us. It's about the freedom we can have in relationship with God as creator, as owner of everything, that everything comes from him. It's about intimate relationship, being familiar with God, because you need to know God's purposes, don't you, in order to steward well. It's, a, it's about the way that we're good news with other people, because we are weird. We are insanely rich. We have huge responsibilities in this world about the good of the world, about the ecology of the world, about the climate of the world. It's fundamentally, green stuff is fundamentally a justice issue, isn't it? Because it's the poor who are going to lose out the most from climate change. Our choices about how we heat our homes, use our money, where we buy, where we invest. I've just had a look at an ISA. Anyone else having a look at an ISA? The return on the ethical one is less than the return on the non ethical one which one should we go for yeah tiny drop in the ocean but the ocean is made up of many drops mother Teresa of Calcutta said there's a huge difference isn't there between dominion in the sense of consume and use for yourself and steward for the good of all. What did Jesus have to say about this? Let's follow through Matthew 25, 14 to 30 this morning. And I just, spoiler alert, it's got a big hit at the end of this parable of the talents. And I would be letting you down if I didn't go right to the end. So this is Jesus speaking. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a a series of parables that he tells that Matthew collects for us. The Olivet, because it's the Garden of Olives. The Olivet series of parables. And they're about the kingdom of heaven, living right with God now and looking forward to being right with God in the future, to eternal life. It's a good news story, but Jesus is saying something about being prepared, about being ready for what is coming. He's just told a parable about some people who were not ready with oil in their lamps. Anyone sang that song? Some foolish maidens, virgins, who were going to a wedding party and some of them were not ready with oil in the lamp when the moment came. So Jesus is trying to say, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, I'm calling to you to be ready. I, I, I'm, I'm, to use the kind of picture I'm saying, don't rely on these badges, labels, lanyards. Be intimate with God, be familiar with God, be a a son, a daughter, be living as a sheep. I said you only had one chance, don't even think about barring. And stewards, here we go. Let's just follow it through. I'm sure lots of us will will welcome the Holy Spirit, God, as we read this, just prompting us. You'll, you'll You'll be giving yourself the talk. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus talking about what it means to live right with God now and forever can be illustrated, he said. So it's a parable. Okay, let's just be careful. It's a parable. It's it's pointing to some bigger truths. Story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants or his stewards and he entrusted. Many of you will have noticed that word before when you've read this. Just let it sink. As I say, the analogy of power of attorney that I've already used might speak to some. He entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Do you notice he didn't tell them exactly what to do? He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. So... 
There is a focus here on money. And this parable does get rightly applied to time, talents, experience, opportunities, the whole big picture. But it also is specifically talking about about money. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Do you notice that? So if I'm saying that stewarding is about grace, about God giving his grace, then Jesus is saying something here about how God gives each one of us gifts and grace, shares with us in proportion to our abilities. Then the man leaves on his trip. This scenario would not have been unfamiliar to Jesus' hearers. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money. Now, notice that word again, invest. So we've noticed noticed entrust. Didn't just get given and told, do this, this and this. Entrusted. There's a sense in which the owner gives over Divine self-limitation here. God restricts himself by saying, I'm taking you seriously. And then the first one invests. And the word contains the sense of action, doesn't it? And thoughtfulness. To invest requires decisions. It requires intelligent action. And he earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work. Notice that. And earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. There's nothing positive in that action, is the implication, is the the, the word picture that Jesus... After a long time, so implication by now the servants are thinking, maybe the master will never come back. Maybe Jesus won't come back today or tomorrow. The master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he'd entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. It actually was a huge amount in those days, but God is saying, with my grace, you know, a little is amazing. Um, You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And the clear picture that Jesus is painting there is of a party, and it's the party of heaven. It's eternal life. It's about joy. Living freely. The servant who received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I've earned two more. The master said exactly the same thing. Notice, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So I, now I will give you more, many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. God is not bothered about the physical output. God does not measure... In terms of, you have done much more for me in my kingdom than this per. What, what's the measure? What's the, serve, the master looking at? It's obedience. It's obedience with what you have in your hand. It's about relationship. It's about then the joy that flows for them both. Let's celebrate Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. Please notice it's a parable, so we don't automatically just say the master equals God. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. 
But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gather crops, I didn't cultivate, why didn't you at least deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have got some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have in abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a parable. But there is a consequence. And being weird, we love to kind of say that there isn't a consequence. That feels very odd in a Western mindset, doesn't it? But I can't escape reading this story told by Jesus that there is a consequence. That there is a judgment. There is an accountability. Maybe you could read it a different way. I can't. Essentially what seems to be going on here is that the servant's defence is first, I did what I thought was best. And secondly, that his fear of the world was greater than his fear of the master. I thought I might lose it. I thought I might get into trouble. I thought it wouldn't go well. Huge discussion points we could have there about that. But I think it's pretty clear, isn't it? That somehow Jesus, at the very end of his life here on earth, just before he's going to go to the cross, when he's trying to say to those who are following him, how can you keep following me? How can you be with me beyond the cross? How can you be in close relationship with God, your creator? How can you be intimate with God, be familiar with God? Then there's something here about the recognition that God is the creator and owner of everything. That he entrusts all that we have to us. That we are personally responsible for whatever is in our hands. You might be a five bag person. You might be a, a one penny person here today. God is not going to hold us accountable for, Andrew, did you do this much or this much? You know, it's, it's what did you do with what you had in your hand? Sitting back and saying, well, it's for everybody else, isn't it? Whether we're talking about the big picture of, in, of creation care or whether we're talking, frankly, friends, about our family finances as a church family. Or any of the ways that God says, I've put stuff in your hands. You are phenomenally blessed to be living at this time in this part of the world. And I'm saying to you, actually, if you want freedom from the, 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 the wrong power of money, possessions, ambition, job titles, lanyards. Then respond to grace, to God's generosity, wholeheartedly. The, the master takes this huge risk, doesn't he, with the entrusting. And God, you know, why on earth are we his plan? for the? I mean, come on, God. But we are. We are. And I know there are people in this room who feel relatively powerless compared perhaps to others. I know there's huge disparities in the wealth in this room. But we do, friends, need to have a sense of a bigger picture. 
And that whatever we have in our hands, it has power. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul writes, For we are co-workers. There's a different way of saying steward. We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, he says. God's building. Each should build with care. And so I do come in to talk about, about money. Because money is not neutral, the Bible says. Money has power. And you can't serve money and be saying that you love God. The two are incompatible. I love the, I love the quote. I use it every gift day. You can buy a really impressive dog, but only love will make its tail wag. You can buy a really impressive dog, but only love will make its tail wag. So Paul, as it was up on the screen, thanks James. Each should give what they've decided in their own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is not about charity. Don't rank your giving in Christian terms alongside the Royal Lifeboat Association, as important as that, as the National Trust. It's different. This is spiritual family. This is us together. This is us saying, how are we going to be God's people into whatever this new season is? And what has God put in my hand to be part of what he's doing here? God isn't short of money. But he he knows the freedom that we can have if we see ourselves as stewards, co-workers, Malachi 3.10, a principle here from the Old Testament that carries into the New Testament. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. There may be food in my house and thereby put me to test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, the tithing principle, here's a picture from Kenya that I showed last week. The tithing principle is perfectly illustrated by what you and I together enable in part of our Kenya partnership. Dave and Rebecca sitting over there with a, with a family who now have 25 sacks of beans rather than the two to five that they normally get because of the project that we as a church help support in itself an illustration of how we're able to sow into what God's doing. But what do they do with those beans? You know what they do? The first thing they do with those beans, they give 10% of them to their church. That's the first thing they do, is give 10% of those beans. The beans that they literally need to live on, to, to send their children to school, for education, for all of those things that you and I perhaps could take for granted, they will say the first part of this, all of this is a blessing from God. And now we are able to give to our church family. If you want to know what the first fruits principle, and by the way, tithing 10% is just a helpful starting point for our Christian giving. But if you want to know what it means, it means having your entire year of security in front of you in some sacks and saying, I'm going to give the first part of this to God rather than see what's left. Eighty five percent of everything that Trinity comes out of our pockets. The other 15 percent, the inland revenue is incredibly generous and supportive of the work of Trinity. Over one hundred thousand pounds a year in gift aid. If you are not giving and ticking the box on gift aid, if you're not a higher rate taxpayer who's taking account of the tax relief that you are going to get that will make the cost of your giving reduce and therefore you adjust it up to take account of that, you are not giving wisely. Over £100,000 through gift aid, but 85% of it comes directly from us. When we look back over the last year, God has blessed us enormously. Um, In 2023, we were forecasting that if we didn't have an increase in giving, we would have had a deficit of £167,000. But we did. We were 
blessed by all of us giving more. And at the year end, we finish with a, a 14,000 deficit, which in the context of our overall budgeting, um, the great Peter Strachan, who was our finance director, used to say, that's just noise. Now, I don't belittle 14,000. I really don't. But, and you can see that for 2024, with continued giving in response to God's generosity, we're forecasting actually we'll have a small surplus at the end of the year. We gave also last year, it's an opportunity this gift day, not only to review our regular giving, to think what am I doing weekly, monthly, because there's pledging regular sums, as we've said, makes it an act of worship. It's, not, it's the first thought, not the last thought. Nikki and I, in 35 years of marriage, can tell you that whenever we have applied this principle to our finance, we have found freedom in our finance. Whenever we have sat down and we've gone through some interesting times and said, what are we going to do first to the Lord? That's just our testimony. Using gift aid, as I've said. So part of today is about the regular. That's why you've got some paperwork on your chairs. But also today is a day in the year, in March, as we come towards our annual meeting, where we invite special giving. And last year we did special giving, didn't we? That actually we directed towards the buildings that we use that are owned for us by the Trinity Cheltenham Trust, Trinity House, Fusion, and now the building next door for church offices. And, and together we gave £43,000. And so we repaired the boilers. If you go into Trinity House for a coffee after this and you feel warm, just allow yourself a small smile. Uh, if you go over to Trinity House and the wall between Trinity House and Fusion doesn't fall on you, <laughs> maybe give an even bigger smile and say, thank you, God, that we were able to deal with that. And we're looking at uh, what we might do in terms of trying to create um, uh, a prayer room space in the garage and various other things. Special projects, well, we did the roof. Guess what's next? The tower. There'll be much more detail about what we do with our money in our annual report and accounts, audit going on at the moment, annual meeting coming up. I, I don't want to in any way divert from proper and full scrutiny of our accounts. But look, friends, it, it is a gift day. It is a day when I'm asking you to think seriously about your action. Two servants took action, one did nothing. And there's a responsibility and an accountability. Each according to what the Lord has given. I am urging you to think about it as something regular, as part of your worship. Because... This is all about grace and freedom. It's such a freedom to be able to pray to God and say, either I need your wisdom with the five bags and or Lord, I've only got a penny. How am I going to make ends meet? There is such freedom when we put money and possessions in their right place in our lives. When we say, you are not going to have power over me. I am going to use you as a steward for the purposes that have been entrusted to me. It's been said, plenty give God credit, fewer give him cash. Cash. 